Right, hi there. Welcome to this week's episode of the Sussex Sport Weekly Podcast. I'm Mark Dunford, and this week I'm joined by Brighton and Hover Albion writers Darren Howard and Frankie Elliott. And we have a special guest this week. He's a columnist for one of our papers and our website, sussexworld.co.uk, and he's an Albion fan, Ian Hart. Welcome, Ian. How long have you been an Albion fan? Um, since the 23rd of April, 1973. So That's very specific. Why, why, why the 23rd of April? Because it was Easter Monday, Brighton versus Portsmouth. Uh, and my dad took took me along to the Goldstone, one all draw, 25p for me to get in, 50p for my dad to get in. Times have changed. <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah. They've changed a little bit, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, one thing that hasn't changed is that it's been another mixed week for the Albion. Following yeah. their demolition of Arsenal at the weekend, they were beaten 4 1 at St James's Park last night against Newcastle United. We will look at those performances and what it means for Albion's European prospects and look ahead to two more big games for the Albion next week. But firstly, though, Darren, it was a rocking night at St James's Park, but not for the Albion, unfortunately. What did you make of the game and how was De Zerbi afterwards? It was a rock. Yeah, the, the St. James's Park were really pumped up for this one. And it, it was just a bit too intense for the Brighton players, really. You just got the feeling that Newcastle were at them from the very start. They pressed them high, um, didn't allow them to play through the back, through the lines as they as they love to do. And yeah, you just have to say Newcastle were just a bit too powerful for them on, on the day. Um, you think Eddie Howe's team, they, they test you physically as well. They're They've got some great technical players up at Newcastle, but all over the pitch on the one-on-one -on -one battles, they really uh, set out to test the, the players physically. And I think probably a few fell short, uh, particularly in the first half. Um, Estupinian, he, he struggled on the left flank a bit. Uh, Almiron was, was excellent. And um, Estupinian has been one of Brighton's best players this season. He's been very consistent. He's a really athletic, powerful player, but, you just get the feeling that they, after the Arsenal game, it's it's just um, you know quite tough, a, bit, a little bit leggy perhaps. And Almiron looked looked very good in the first half in in particular, um, and also Matoma, Caicedo, they they weren't at their best uh, either. Uh, McAllister, he was he was surprisingly sort of on the on the bench um, uh, for this one, and I guess again that's sort of a follow on from the Arsenal, the amount of minutes that he's played. And you, you just got the feeling that De Zerbi was perhaps prioritising the Southampton game where they're going to bring the likes of Colwell back, McAllister back, um, where they can really... They need just need two more wins to, to get the European place with three games left to go. So so I think with the, with the injuries and the fatigue just biting at the moment, De Zerbi's doing all he can just to get them over the line, really. Um, and... Yeah, but I, I think they're still in a good place. They've got three games to go, two two to win, and I think they can bounce back. They've shown previously that they can bounce back from bad results and uh, and come again. Excellent, Frankie. Were you surprised by the result and the performance from Albion? Um, I wasn't surprised by the by the results. I have to say, um, I thought I could see, especially after playing Arsenal on Sunday and winning, which was a big thing. I, I felt that the sort of mental and physical fatigue going up against an excellent. Newcastle side would be difficult. Newcastle have won five of their last home games. Um, they've been thriving there when the crowd of that size. I remember when Newcastle weren't playing so well uh, under the Mike Ash year, they used to fear playing at home because that crowd could easily turn your back and having 55,000 against you is, is very difficult. But to have them all behind you like they did last night, as they did against Manchester United a couple of weeks ago when they put in that excellent performance to win 2 0, it makes it almost nigh on impossible to get going. Um, but the way to control that. I said last week that Brian could use it in their favour by making it nervy, staying in the game for as long as possible and, and keeping the ball like they normally do and keeping the possession to to, to keep uh, Newcastle at bay. And as long as the game went on, they would get more edgy about needing to win. But that was the issue was the performance was what surprised me. I think they never really, this is probably the worst Brian had played under the Zerbi. They never got the passing going. There was no sharpness to their play. Um, they couldn't play out from the back at all. The high press completely suffocated them um, and because of that Newcastle were on top straight away the crowd were right behind them and it overwhelmed the first half those two set pieces coming into the box it felt inevitable just corner after corner closing that uh, press after press it just felt like it was a siege um, it improved in the city improved in the second half um, the players like McAllister came on but as you're chasing a game 
you know, leaving space in behind for, for someone like Callum Wilson um, is is always bad news, as we saw from those final two goals. Him having the freedom of the of the Brighton half to, to run in on goal um, is what is what led to is what led to it being such a, a bigger scoreline than than probably than probably was deserved. Um, but as as Darren alluded to, um, it was it wasn't a great performance, uh, but that was mainly due to to the number of players missing uh, and then people like Cole Will not starting, Van Heck coming in for for only his second Premier League start. I mean, he's a good player, but that's a hell of a game to come into as your as, as a starting centre back for a young player like that, um, and not not be as prepared for somebody like Callum Wilson and Isak, um, and also no McAllister as well, who is a is a big game player. So I I got the feeling by. Zerbi selection, how he spoke after the game, he saw this game as a free hit. I think after the Arsenal win, they're in a very strong position, as Darren alluded to, with just needing two wins um, to, to, to qualify for Europe. I think he, uh, he assessed what he has in front of him four games in 12 days and said, the Newcastle one is where I'll rest my players, except that, you know, this is a difficult ground to try and get a victory from and look to the Southampton game. Uh, and even the Manchester City game with, with them having eyes on the final um and obviously the crunch game of it at the end, those three games are the ones where we look for the two victories. So it was a disappointing night, um, both in result and performance, which is a very rare thing. But I think it was understandable, uh, given what Zerbi laid his team out. Uh, so I don't think he'd be too disappointed, if I'm honest. Yeah. Hearty, were you disappointed or do you think the scoreline for really. Newcastle I was, a bit? I was just thinking, Frank, have you been looking at my homework? Because I put free hit down as well. <laughs> um, uh, I, I just look. It, it's the it's the dying embers of of a, of a momentous season, probably the greatest season in the club's history. Hope, hopefully, to be surpassed by next season. Um, am I right in thinking, though, if results go our way tomorrow, we only need one win. We only need to beat Southampton. If Villa and Tottenham don't pick up points tomorrow, and we win on Sunday, have we not qualified for Europe then? Yeah, I think that's that's that is a possibility. Um, but yeah, if re, if results don't go their way, they they still need the two wins. Yeah. But um, but yeah, you're right. You're right, Ian. Yeah. And yeah. I think it is all about Sunday. And I and I think as soon as the selection came out, um, it it was all 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 about Sunday. The the previous Sunday was superb. Um, so look, we, look, it is it is what it is, as they say on a well known show on ITV too. Um, Let's just go forward. Uh, I'm really looking forward to Sunday. Um, for years, when Brighton were at the lower reaches of the football league, we had all that propaganda from the Hampshire lot, where you know that we weren't a big club. And lo and behold, the cream always rises to the top. Slow but sure wins the race. The tortoise and the hare. I can go on. We are the best team on the south coast. We will be the best team on the South Coast for at least a decade. Um, we've got the best owner. We're the best run club. Let's just get out there Sunday, get the win, where the results go for us. I do think we are going to qualify for Europe. And then that's when the hard hard work really starts. Because um, well, I, I know we're going to talk, talk about recruitment shortly, but uh, the squad isn't big enough to play European football and English Premier League football. So we really need in, in the summer window to get a, a squad size where we don't get found wanting. Um, I think we it, it it was a diff, it was a combination last night between squad size and a long hard season and all those games in a short space of time. But I'm confident we will beat Southampton and uh, confident that we will be going on our European tour. Can I just yeah. add as well, as as well as um, all of those of those things, you have to really credit Newcastle as well. Um, they have been excellent this season. Uh, and when push came to shove, I said last week the pressure might get to them. They didn't show that at all. Um, and I think people like Callum Wilson, Isak, Kieran Trippier, Dan Byrne um, have phenomenal seasons. Um, and I think last night's proved that they are worthy of playing Champions League football next year. Three Absolutely. cheers for Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> Um, worth mentioning, you're saying what a well run club it is. Worth mentioning Paul Barber winning CEO of the year this this week. So congratulations to him. Um, Frankie, back to you. Um, Albion's record against the top five this season has actually been really impressive. Uh, with I think Man City the only team they've yet to take points from. Um, why do you think they've been so good against the better sides, if you want to call them that, this year? Yeah, I mean, to answer that question, it's best to start actually start with the two biggest weaknesses um Brian have at the moment. Uh 
in the defeats we saw well, last night, especially, their two biggest weaknesses are, are set pieces and counter-attacks. Um, Newcastle's first two goals last night obviously came from corners and free, uh, and free kicks. They've had numerous goals. I think they're in the top five or six this season in the Premier League for conceding from set pieces. Um, and then in regards, and we're obviously against the big sides, uh, the top six, they're not normally renowned for being teams that like to physically dominate at set pieces. So that, that does help Brighton in that sense. Um, but then in regards to the counter-attacking, uh, we've seen under Zerbi, he is a big uh, admirer and focuses on possession football. He wants his teams to have the ball as much as possible. Um, and so in regards to that, how that works, uh, he has obviously got, as you'll see throughout, as we saw at Wembley when we all turned up and, and last night and even in... Um, games gone by, you'll regularly see centre-backs, Dunk, Colwell, Wobsett, standing, just standing with the ball at their feet. Um, this is because when they're playing against the lower teams, they are sitting in in a low block, a def low defensive block. And the whole idea is that Brian are trying to keep the ball, but trying to bait the players out. So they're waiting for the striker to come and press the defender. And then through the way they're set up, it's a number of a few quick passes and they've opened up uh, the, the team they are playing against. Now, against a top team like Arsenal, Manchester United and Liverpool, where they picked up some, some memorable victories, uh, they will not accept sitting in a low block. They will also want to dominate the ball. So... When a goal kick is taken by Jason Steele and he plays it to Lewis Duncan and Webster, you will normally see the striker rushing to try it in a high press try and win ball back, similar to what we saw from Newcastle last night, who did it very successfully. But that is what Brighton want. They want you to come uh, and press the ball. They play quick, intricate passes between Dunk, Webster, Caicedo and McAllister. They've beaten your first press and all of a sudden they're on your back line and they and you'll normally see a through ball as we saw against mm -hmm. Arsenal for the for the first goal on Sunday a through ball to Matoma or March on the other wing or Buonate has it or in CISO recently and that ball is from a ball that so the winger comes from the wide position inside to their through on goal and that is how it's been devastating against those teams because as I said they play into Brighton's hands they would go and normally play Brighton and look to dominate possessing themselves and all of a sudden they find themselves being dominated themselves and they're not used to it um mm -hmm. But against the smaller teams who sit in uh, in a low block and look to to catch Brian on the counter attack, that's where they get more success. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at the goals against uh, Everton a couple of weeks ago, they did it perfectly. Sean Dyche set them up brilliantly. He said, "Look, we're going to have to sit in deep uh, because Brian don't have the sort of Kevin De Bruyne's or Martin Odegaard who can unpick." very, very tight defences. They've got quality players, but not that world-class level that can do against the teams that are basically uh, parking the bus is the famous phrase. Um, and so they nick the ball from a sloppy pass or, or a bad touch. Um, and especially when players are fatigued, as Brian have over the last couple of weeks, that happens much more often. Um, so we've seen against Nottingham Forest, Danilo scored from nicking the ball off Caicedo. Everton scored two or three goals where Brighton were in their half and all of a sudden they, they broke on them at pace. Um, and uh, Newcastle last night, their final two goals came from breakaway attacks as well. Um, so it's an interest, it's a fantastic and an interesting tactic to see a team outside the big six look to play uh, so much passing football in some dangerous areas as well. We've seen Jason Steele picking up the ball almost uh, 20 yards from his goal and looking not to knock it long, but to play a five-yard mm. pass. It's great to watch. Um, it's exciting to watch. And it has been really, really effective against the big five clubs. I mean, their record has been phenomenal. Uh, but it just needs a bit more fine-tuning, I'd say, for it to be a, uh, a successful tactic for all 20 mm. Premier League teams. But yeah, in regards to why Albion are so, are so good at um, playing the big teams is because they play like a big team and they do it really, really yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. Hearty, you're having a bit of trouble there. You okay back with us? Yeah, yeah no, I've, I've, I've moved downstairs now. I've, <laughs> I've moved out the West Wing. I've come down the downstairs office. So, no, all good. Fair all good. good. But, yeah. but I was, you know, echo what Frankie said, you know, that we are a team that, that really go for it now. Um, our, our previous manager was, was inclined to have the handbrake on and our, and our previous manager before that, had, uh, had the handbrake on most of the time, but you have to say about our our DZ, fortune favours the brave. He really does go for it, and at times you are going to come unstuck, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned uh, Jason Steele there, Frankie. Um, Darren, he's been he was impressive again last night. Jason Steele, it could have been a lot more, wouldn't it? He pulled off a couple of great saves. Um, obviously, but Robert Sanchez was left out of the squad for Arsenal and did not travel to Newcastle. Is this the end of his career at Brighton, or do you think he's just out of favour at the moment? Is still the better keeper? 
it, 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 yeah, it was a strange one for Steele last night. He actually played very well and conceded conceded four goals. And I think he's when he he played well at Stoke City back at back earlier in the season, and he really came into the team and he got exactly what Deserby wanted to try and do. He's, he'd been working on it in training, and he he impressed in that game against Stoke. And you you got the feeling then Deserby thought he is. He's going to be my number one. Um, and Sanchez, he's he had a, a rapid rise in, into the team. So he was promoted by Graham Potter. Um, Matty Ryan was put put to one side and uh, and Rob Sanchez was given a glove. So it was a bold move by, by Graham Potter at the time to uh, to bring in Sanchez as his number one. And and largely it worked. Sanchez has been pretty good. He's, he's a young keeper. He's he's been known for, for some high profile mistakes as uh, as as well and i think that there were a couple that he had i think there was a one against crystal palace as well just prior to when steel uh, played against stoke and i think coupled with that and and the fact that steel is better with his feet deserby um went for uh, went for jason steel and sanchez was on the uh, on the sidelines um and i think it came to a head after the everton game um, still conceded five again. He didn't really play that badly against Everton, um, and I, 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 I imagine Sanchez would have thought, "Hang on, this is my chance to to get back in the team. Um, here I am. Uh, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready for the Arsenal game." Um, that wasn't the case. Uh, I guess there would have been a a, a bit of a, a heated discussion between between the two, and then Sanchez said, "Well, I'm not going to sit on the bench." At, at Arsenal, um, which as a Brighton fan and as a team going for Europe, I, I personally think that that's probably out of order from from Sanchez to do that. And you would want everybody in that squad to be pushing for this for this goal of of uh, reaching Europe. And Sanchez is perhaps a bit of a disruptive element in in that at the moment. And Deserbi was said, "Well, you know, I'm not having that." Um, as he did similar with Trossard when Trossard wanted to move to Arsenal, he's he's he, he he sticks a firm line, and it's all about what's best for the team, what's best for the squad, what's best for the harmony in the, in the, in the squad. And I think he's looked at Sanchez and just thought, I'm not going to put up with that. Um, and I guess he's whether Sanchez needs an apology, where has to apologise or work his way back in now to to be considered. Um, it's unclear exactly where where that point is, but I would be surprised to see him back in the squad for, for Southampton, unless there's some sort of reconciliation. Apparently he has been training. He is, he is around the training ground, but he's just not traveling to, to the matches. So, so it's a, it's a very delicate point in his career, I think now. So his, I, I think my, just my opinion, I think he should probably just toe the line and just ride this period out. And still is the number one and he has to work his way way back into the into the team um but yeah the summer's going to be an interesting time for him that's that's for sure yeah what, what's your opinion on sanchez as a keeper and this current beha well behavior we don't know the full details but uh what do you think hi i think sanchez is probably not as good as his him and his agent think uh, he is <clears throat> um i think he's i think he's very lucky um that he was lucky that Graham Potter gave gave him a chance i always was always a big matty ryan fan and I think um, in, you know, with Darren talks about the Palace mistake, which which was a howler, which most goalies have got a howler in them every so often. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, Sanchez was very lucky with substitution still in the bank that um, Deserby didn't hook him out at Wembley in, in, in the 119th minute and put Steele on for mm. the penalty shootout. And I firmly believe oh, I'm in that camp there we might be playing Manchester City twice this uh, this season now. Yeah. If Steele had been in goal for the penalty shootout, um, I think Sanchez could have still been there now and wouldn't have got near the Man United spot kick. So, um, and look, 50 years, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot older than the, than the three of you. They come, they go. Um, and the, the thing is, the constant about Brighton of Albion is the fans. And players come, players go. To a degree, he has served us well, but I won't lose any sleep if he leaves because we because we've got this great recruitment 
um, system than this great recruitment department, and we will get another keeper. And at the moment, Steele is the best keeper at the club, so he has to play. Full yeah. stop. And and who's, who's your favourite keeper from past years, Hi? Put you on who's the spot my favourite keeper? Well, from a, from Bayern, yeah. Yeah, it's a, a bit of a hard one, because John Keeley is my brother-in-law, so I'm always going <laughs> to have to no, you know, I'd, I'd go back as far as Brian Powney was in goal, uh, but Peter Grummet was a great keeper. Eric Steele, Graham Mosey, who I'm seeing at the Cup Final reunion dinner tonight. Perry Digweed, to a to a degree, didn't 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 play as much. I think that probably the the unsung hero, which would have been and his career really should have gone a little bit further than it did, was Mark Beanie, who we had to sell to Leeds to settle the VAT bill. Um, when mm-hmm. we were at the, the gold, Goldstone and probably the, the greatest save he made at the Goldstone was when he left because he saved the football club. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, Beanie, Beanie was a decent keeper. But Sanchez, and, and this is where I do like RDZ, uh, you know, that he, he is, and apologies to Mickey Adams, Mark McGee, Chris Catlin, everybody that's come before, he is the greatest manager this club has ever had. Um, and one of the things is, that he doesn't take any crap off anybody, you know. And Trossard came back from the World Cup and thought and thought he was Kevin De Bruyne reborn, or you know. And and and, it, and <laughs> De Zerbi is brilliant because he because he just won't take it. And it's mm. the same with uh, Sanchez. And long and long may it continue because once the tail starts wagging the dog, then you got a problem. Yeah, and I agree. With have that. got too yeah. much power at the moment, sort of money wise. But RDZ has got that that um, great dressing room going, and uh, you know I, I I think he he's good. San Sanchez, thank you. But if this is the end, good luck in the rest of your career. But yeah. ho- I I hope you've learned the lessons of your uh, petulance because this is all it is petulance. Yeah, Harley raises a good point there as well. Sorry, just to just to finish on yeah. that is the issue that Brighton have is, is not necessarily the players is is their agents. Um, we've seen it already. Caicedo in the in January had signed for a new agency company. Oh, you know, a couple of days later, he has written a hmm. uh, Instagram post saying he wants to leave, uh, but the, the t- his hometown is spelt wrong. So that screams an agent driven move. I think the Trossard thing as well. His agent was a nightmare during that. Uh, Sanchez is. Um, um, these players are very good young players, but the problem with football agents is they tell them they're better than they currently are, and so this can lead to uh, issues in all football clubs uh, of, of sort yeah. of below the top six. Is when you have a good player, they get signed to a good agent who wants to get them a good deal because they all want to make a lot of money, um, and that's why Deserby, as Hardy said, has been brilliant because. They and Brighton in general cut through all this sort of nonsense. They know the value of the player. They know to try and keep them grounded. And if they misbehave, as Trossard did, um, and it seems as Sanchez is doing, then you then you've then you've cut your ties really. Um, this and is Brian be a vicious... dealt with the modern football world very well. Sorry, Frankie. This is going to be a vicious circle until agents are regulated properly. And if you look at the amount of money that goes out of the game into the pockets of the agents, until the FA. And the, and the EPL get a little bit of, of, of gumption. I was going to use a word, but this is a family show. <laughs> a, a little bit of gumption, and they actually start regulating agents properly. We won't have that. I mean, that as you say, Frankie, that that Instagram post was was sort of written by someone to, sitting there GCSEs. I mean, it, it, it was awful. And again, and it, and it unsettled us. A difficult, you know, a, a, an important time. We had Liverpool win the FA Cup, and I just think, you know, the agents are not a, not a positive. Mm-hmm. And until we regulate them, this is going to just keep on happening. Absolutely. Well, I don't think Sanchez or the agent, if they, I don't think he's going to go to a top six club or a Champions League club. I, I think at the moment he makes he's made too many mistakes in in his. I think he still needs to to learn a bit more before he can take that next step to a to a bigger a bigger club. So I don't know where he or his agent think that he could go. That's probably better than Brighton at the moment. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's good. Maybe point. abroad. Maybe go back to Spain, Italy, somewhere like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You see, because no. their selling point is that we are playing in the, all their players are playing in the best league on the planet, aren't they? The EPL. Yeah. 
without doubt. So that's a great selling point. Um, they probably won't show the Palace game on his show reel. <laughs> but um, you know, in the main, he is a decent keeper, but he's not the best keeper by a country mile that I've seen at, at the club. So yeah, if he goes, he goes. Tough, you know. Long live yeah. the king. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> talking about recruitment, um, it looks like Brighton could be signing Mahmoud Dahoud and James Milner. Um, it's been reported this week. We know all about Milner, but um, what can you tell us about Dahoud and what he will bring to Albion, Frankie? And what would also would would, would Milner bring as well? Yeah, they're, it's they're interesting statements um, because we we've spoken about uh, Brian needs to bolstering their squad, um, maybe moving away from the sort of younger player model because they need to have players that are ready to compete. Uh, from the first day of the season. Obviously, if, if they do get into Europe, they'll be playing three times a week and, and rotation will be needed much more than it has been this season. Um, but they've not, they're not looking at saying breaking the bank. I know Gel Pedro wow. is their record signing, but they've also done a, a clever move of getting two two free signings in the door in, in Milner and Dehoud. Um Dehoud to me, seems like the, I, you don't want to say just a replacement because he's more than that, but the McAllister role, so to speak, a very technical midfielder, elegant uh, on the ball, um, is known for liking to pick the ball, for picking the ball up from his centre backs and moving it into the attacking phases for his wingers and forwards, um, and and sort of that is McAllister's main uh, role in in the Brighton team. I know he, he plays in the more advanced role at times, but that sort of deep six role alongside Caicedo, I could really see Dehu doing that, and he's done it. He, uh, really, really well for both Borussia Mönchengladbach and and Dortmund. Um, he was one of the um, up and coming stars of German football in in 2015, 2016. He was signed by Thomas Tuchel to replace Gundogan after he joined Manchester City the, for 12 million euros. He was he was seen as the sort of next big thing to play in the German national team. It's not really happened for him. Uh, injuries have got in the way for a number of seasons, and and, and his form has not been up to standard, but. Uh, Brighton have done really well at, at picking up these sort of players. We spoke about Danny Welbeck a couple of weeks ago and how and how well they did to sort of give him a second career. Adam Lallana is still flourishing. I know he's injured at the moment, but he's had been he's been brilliant under Zerbi. Uh, so a player like Dahoud, who is who has played at Champions League football, you know Europa League football, he's played twice for the German national team. He is a a, a high skilled player and has experience at the highest level. To give him a home and, and to take him away from that glaring spotlight of a of a big European club may really suit him. He's, he suits the style of football perfectly. The technical ability he has will no doubt uh, uh, prick De Zerbi's ears up. Um, but also he he will offer defensive qualities as well. When he was playing for Munchen Gladbach, he had the highest number of interceptions per 90 minutes of any central midfielder. Um, and that, again, is what Caicedo brings to the team. Uh, so to have two of them offering that protection to the back four um, would would be excellent. Um, with James Milner, that's another uh, interesting one in regards to the fact they're signing a 37-year-old. Um, and he had played Premier League football for 21 years now. He's won the Premier League title at Manchester City and Liverpool. And he's obviously... Uh, won the Champions League as well. So he has got, the, he, they could not be signing more experience if they tried. Um, he's also a highly skilled player. Uh, set piece wise, he's one of the best penalty takers in the Premier League. Great free kick taker, great corner taker. Um, and is also really, really versatile. Can play at fullback, uh, can play at centre mid, both as a more advanced centre mid or as sitting at the base of, of the midfield. The only issue I would, I would see with it, or I'm trying to work out, is that obviously he is a you know, the modern professional, he's excellent, doesn't drink, um, has never has never touched alcohol, and this is why he's still playing at 37. But father time does catch up to all players regardless, um, and he will be 38 going into next season. I feel one of the main reasons he's been able to play for so long is he's been surrounded by world-class players. Um, so using his experience and know-how, he can get through games with playing along, alongside the likes of Mo Salah and Van Dyke. I feel coming to Brighton after so many years around the world-class facilities that Liverpool and Manchester City have, I'm interested to see how he will take moving to Brighton. Brighton is still, you know, they're not they're not, they're not the, a huge step down, but it is a step down. And also the players are a step down. Um, so whether he will play that much, I can't see that happening. I see it more as a step into coaching role, working alongside Anne Lallana, who I know is a good mate of his and is also doing his, his coaching badges. Um, but in regards to the experience, like I said, he will 
brings so much to all those young players that we've been seeing playing for Brighton this season. Um, but yeah, two two interesting signs straight off the bat. Very early on as well. This this season hasn't even finished, um, and it looks to me that Brighton are saying uh, are being very shrewd as they always are in the market. But they are moving towards getting players that are, are ready to challenge the first team rather than uh, ones for the future. Uh, quiz time. Can anyone tell me who James Milner came on for when he made his debut for Leeds as a 16 or 17 year old? Ooh. He's got a Crawley Town, Crawley Town connection. Uh, Harry, Harry Kill. Harry Kill. That's exactly Kill. right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, he came on for Harry Kill to make his debut. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. So with Joe Pedro, Pedro already in the bag, is it good to see them business doing early? Um, getting all the business done early, uh, Harty. Yeah, I think it is. You know, we were, we've had years going going back years of of panic buy. So we all remember Chris O'Grady's panic buy with um, Sammy Sammy Hoop here all those years ago. Um, no, I, I think it's superb. Going on to say, you know, echo what Frankie said. Um, Milner is is a is more a, a nod to getting some experience in the dressing room in, in what will be a very challenging season. Moving into to, to coaching. We've seen in the last 24 hours what a calm head can do in a dressing room. You know, Darren Moore turned Sheffield Wednesday down, around in, uh, in like six days um, from being down and out. He's basically built them up. And, and, I, and I see Milner's role equally off the field as it is on the field, working with these younger players. And, a, and a, you know, as much as I like a beer, a great example to youngsters that he's never had a drink, um, yeah. you know, and, and you know, and, and showing that you know what they can do, um, you know, looking after their uh, bodies, the longevity of their careers. But no, I mm -hmm. think Pedro is, is a is a decent signing. Um, I think we're obviously going to lose the, the main two. I, I hope we don't lose any more. Um, well, we might even lose Sanchez, but that's that, that's no loss. So. Um, <laughs> So, no, no, yeah, I, I think it's really good and get, gets in early and, of course, helps the season ticket sales. Yeah, absolutely. Very much so. Um, so this week, we've already mentioned they've got uh, Southampton on Sunday and then uh, the all-conquering super team Man City on uh, Wednesday. Yeah. Well, as we've said, if they, if they could be in Europe by the end of um, Sunday or it might be on Wednesday. Uh, I'm assuming you think they can do it. And how excited as a Brighton fan are you for a European adventure next year? Oh, I can't wait. This is a dream come true. You know, this is this is this is everything. When 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 you've been at the bottom of the football league, uh, with you know eleven points adrift in the Christmas of 1996, we um, for Steve Grit's first game against Hull at, at, at the Goldstone, we, we were still. In the in the midst of a civil war, we bought three thousand whistles to try and dis, disrupt the game. Um, so so to, to to come from there to where we are now, you know, just a, just a nod to Coventry and Luton with the, with their multi million pound playoff final. That they 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 both had similar tales of woe to to what the Albion fans have had. So it's a, so it's a real fill up and a real feel good story. You know, we, we haven't got foreign owners and, and people splashing their cash. These are real football clubs and Brighton are a real football club and everything that, that the fans deserve. I think it will happen on Sunday. I think we'll beat Southampton and I think results will have gone our way. Um, City is another free hit. You know, is one of Frankie's free hits. And, <laughs> you know, and then... Um, Villa could be a dead rubber like they used to have in the Davis Cup, you know, at the end of the Davis Cup. So, look, it's exciting times. And uh, when when a lot of the fans have been through an awful lot and it's thoroughly deserved and I'm and I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. But I do, do hope we we um, we draw Monaco and Roma because that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be amazing, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um Darren, if they're going to beat Man City, is this their best chance? They've likely have won the league by then. Then they and they'll be preparing for the FA Cup and Champions League. They want that treble. Is it a good time for Brighton to play them at the Amex and just uh, put on a show? <laughs> well, it's when is yeah. If if there is ever a good time to face Manchester City, maybe. But um, they're just an absolute machine at the moment, aren't they? They're just in in this groove. Um, 
I, I remember thinking ahead of the Everton game, like that it was sandwiched in between the two Real Madrid matches in the Champions League. And you thought, well, Everton had just beaten Brighton 5-1. It was on the back of that. And Man City just beat them quite comfortably at Goodison Park. Like at the first 20 minutes, Goodison Park was really, you know, pumped up for it. And they sensed that some, you know, this could be a big occasion for them. But they just, yeah, got into Manchester City mode. They're in this frame of mind at the moment. And it's very difficult playing against them. You, you know, they comfortably beat Everton and then just brushed Madrid aside um, uh, a couple of days later. So, yeah, I, I think also with, with Brighton's injury issues as well, they're, they're playing a lot of youngsters at the moment. So I think the, the main focus will be on Southampton, uh, get that result in the bag, hopefully, um, and then they can, as you say, have a, have a, a, a go at Manchester City with perhaps not the pressure on it that they which there might have been but um at the moment i don't think there is a good time to face <laughs> manchester city so. you agree with that frankie yeah uh, well i mean the the only um ray of hope i would give is that this happened two years ago um when brighton played manchester city before they'd won the league um and they were looking towards the champions league final against chelsea um they played them at the amex uh they'd already become champions and, and did beat them 3-2 um, so they, they've done it before um, and if there was ever a time it would be when they have an eye on two finals and have already secured the league there may be some players rested there may be uh, a slight foot off the gas sort of situation um, but as Darren said it is quite scary because you looked at that uh, Everton game as, as everyone did and went, yeah, they, they look, they've got one on the second leg of the Real Madrid game, which isn't done. They're playing a team that won 5-1 at home in Goodison Park is famous for, for, you know, dragging teams, those Everton teams out in, in those games to, to, to victories. And it was just so comfortable and they breathe and they, and they brushed them aside with some real, uh, you know, in moments of genius from Gundogan and Haaland and that game was 3-0. And then against Real Madrid, who, you know, have been one of the best, well, the best team in Europe for the last 10 years, that first half in particular, they made them like a championship team. They made them look not only average, poor, um, and they are not that. Real Madrid are far from that. So I would say it is the best time. It is 100% the best time. A team that's just been uh, named champions of the league uh, who are hopefully celebrating. Yes, you want to play in them, but this Manchester team is 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 very scary and very ruthless. Um, so I, I I still don't see them winning it as Darren alluded to the the injury list it is piling up and, and it's affecting the the team and how they're playing. But um, they've done it before, so, <laughs> so, so let's yeah. hope they can they, they can do it again. <laughs> Absolutely. And hi, are this, is this current Man City side the best Premier League team you've seen? I think it's the best Premier League team we've ever seen. Um, it's obviously different games, different times, different pitches. Different. I mean, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember uh, the Ajax side with Johan Cruyff playing in successive European Cup finals when, when that was one of the only live live games we had on the TV. Um, the great Liverpool side with Dalglish and Souness and Hansen and, you know, the, the superb players there. But it is a superb side. It's one of those quirks of fate, but I'm sure he's he's a Norwegian through and through. But Haaland was 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 born in Leeds Infirmary, so he could actually play for England. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it, 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 he is a one-off. I, I think Freak is a little bit unkind. He is just he, he's a he's a superb player. Um, you know, like, like a Greaves, a, you know, a, a Raul, a Butcher Gaino. He, he is a mm. one-off. He's a once in a generation player. Um, Great to to see them flying the flag, and hopefully, um, you know their their dreams will come true in Istanbul. Um, I don't think we'll beat them. I think we'll get a draw. Um, it's, look, this is the other thing about playing in the in the best league in, uh, on the planet. We get to see all the best players. Um, yeah, and uh, and it, and it's great to actually see right and up the right end of the table, and long and long may it continue. Um, yes, yeah, look, it's just great. See, I think Grealish is is Grealish is different gravy, and I think he was fantastic on Tuesday. He will, he, mm. he, he he will Wednesday, grow in to be one of the best players of his generation, and um, it's bizarre that Tottenham balked at paying an extra fifteen million for him, didn't they? That one <laughs> transfer window, they, they 
Villa wanted 40 and Tottenham would only pay 25. Um, you know, but that's life. <laughs> uh, look, it's important and, and, um, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, you know, Europe is coming. It's on It's on the horizon. Um, no more Gillingham. No more <laughs> Ooh, We're going to Monaco. <laughs> or, or, or Ajax even but no yeah. it's great fun uh, and, and, and great for the club and I'm, I'm pleased for Tony Bloom because he's really put his heart and soul into this and most importantly opened his wallet but I'm pleased that Dick Knight at 84 will actually live to see the Albion playing in, in, in Europe because yeah. he's another architect um, you know someone that we, we we wouldn't be where we are today without Dick Knight Absolutely. And Tony Bloom. Yeah. They should both have a statue. Maybe holding <laughs> hands. That'd be nice. <laughs> That'd be lovely. Just on the sorry, but the final thing on the City team as well um, is if they win, I think two of their remaining games, they finish on ninety plus points again uh, for the fourth time in five years, which is the a phenomenal thing. Not not yeah. only to be an excellent team, but to consistently get more points. And, uh, you know, most of the teams back in the early noughties and, and, and mid noughties was you look at 85 to 88 points to, to win the league um, and to do 90 plus and to do 95 plus three times. It, it's, it's just, it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing yeah. consistency of perfection. It's crazy. It is to a degree, Frankie, but if you've got <laughs> less 25 players in, in, in Europe and you paid for them, Obviously, your owners might expect it every year, mightn't they? So, well, I mean, Chelsea, Chelsea and United have bought the best players in Europe over the four, last four or five years, and that, they seem to be a lot worse. So, I don't, know, <laughs> it's, uh, yes, I don't yeah. know necessarily. It's just buying the players. I mean, obviously, that's yeah. a, a huge part of it, but you've got to be coached well. And you know, yeah. Yeah. I'm not like I say winning the league might be part of it, but I'm saying winning the league by that many points is is just down to no, the no, coaching. No, no, no. That was that was a that was a little bit uh, tongue in cheek. They are the, the deserved champions. I don't think Arsenal have blown up. I just don't think they were good enough. No. Uh, yeah, agreed. Good. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and maybe that, but they they come on leap, leaps and bounds now, um, and hopefully that that they'll challenge again next uh, next year. I think Newcastle with their financing, that you know they they're going to run close and Man United and Liverpool. So so we. So we've probably got ourselves in the top six now because I think uh, Chelsea are going to be a, a few years in the wilderness. Touch yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good though, isn't it? That there's still that level of competition despite everything. Like when you look at some of the leagues around Europe with PSG, you got Bayern Munich, they win the Bundesliga at Canter every year. Um, you know, it's Spain, it's Madrid or Barcelona. But in the Premier League, there's that, you know, it's, there's still that, sort of jeopardy and uh, you know you never quite know which way it's going to go if one just dips off a little bit so yeah, yeah. absolutely absolutely and uh you mentioned it's all about how you coach them and uh deserby has been nominated for premier league manager of the year first of all um i'll start with you darren does he deserve it um, i think he does but who else should have been nominated that wasn't nominated i haven't got the list in front of me but i think it was um it was emery marco silva pep guardiola Somebody else help me out. Mikel Arteta. Was Eddie Howe? Oh, and Eddie Howe. And, oh, and, Eddie Howe and, and Eddie Howe, yeah. Six, six of them. Um, I, I think it, I, I would like to say yes, we, we've deserved it, but it, it is all about, I, I think if you if he gets into Europe, then I'll say yes, for sure. Uh, but that, that's sort of just the ruthless nature of the of the Premier League. It is, it is about results. But I think Frankie made a good shout. We were talking about it, I think, earlier in the week, and he, he pointed out Gary O'Neill at Bournemouth as yeah, well. No. But they, they, they were... They were toast. They they just looked absolutely dead and buried. And I, I was quite impressed with them when they came to the to the Amex. I thought they really gave a good performance against the Brighton team that were that were you know in really good form at that time. And Brighton really struggled to to beat them. And I think the way he's got them organised and playing good football as well. I remember the result they got at Tottenham. Mm. You know they really played some great stuff that that day. And I think he he's uh, that was a good shout from Frankie. He, he deserves a lot of credit. Uh, for Gary and the other job he's done at former. Yeah, he stole your thunder there a bit, Frankie. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, no, I, 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 um, yeah, I have to say, I think obviously you look at and the Premier League is, is right to do it when they do these, um, short list they look at the teams that have excelled in regards to challenging for titles and, and getting European places and so I I understand why they've gone for those six I mean and and you, you would argue with Marco Silva as well Fulham were on most teams list to 
to go down or be be in trouble at the start of the season. But the fact they managed to be challenging for Europe up until about five weeks ago, it, you know, you have to give him credit as well for this, that he built a really good Fulham side that beat Brighton uh, both times this season. So, so that I understand why he's on the list, but like uh, Darren just said there, I, I don't know a single, and I mean this both of them, but I don't know a single person in football, professional journalists, pundits, fans, everyone would have said Bournemouth and not only going down, but 20th uh, at the start yeah, of the season. Yeah. Um, and and, and, and right, exa- exactly, yeah, you know, right, they lost 9-0 to Liverpool and everyone was like, this is the, yeah. the classic thing we we're expecting and they appointed a man who'd never done a head coach role before he was a, obviously a former player and a very good Premier League former player, but he never done, he never managed a team, let alone a Premier League team struggling at the bottom of the table. Um, and they're safe with three games to go. They've beaten Liverpool, they've beaten Tottenham away. He's built a really solid structure. Um, they were unlucky not to get a draw against Brighton at the Amex after Matoma scored in the last minute. Um, and and you have to say credit where it's due because uh, bigger teams, Leeds, Everton, Leicester, you know. Premier League winning teams are struggling much worse than them with two games to go. And for someone to achieve, to achieve that um, with no previous experience, I, I can't see how you can't be shortlisted. I don't yeah. know what else you have to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Hi, you agree, I'm assuming, yeah? Yeah, no, no, I think, I think you're both Darren and Frankie are bang on with, with the Gary O'Neill thing. Um, you do wonder with, with RDZ, RDZ is thoroughly... <laughs> And he was clearly on Brighton's radar a long time um, before he got the job um, in, in that sad September time. We just lost the Queen and then we uh, we we uh, lost Potter on the same day, I think. But uh, you do wonder if, if Todd Bowley had started courting Potter in June rather than August and we'd had Deserby had had a pre-season and had had 38 games. And, you know, might, might we still be in the hunt for Champions League? But who knows? I've, having been at the bottom of the football league, I'll no. take anything that's going. <laughs> so, um, no, it's brilliant. Um, I hope he does get a good, you know, get a good... Is it a voting thing or is it done by... Yeah. Judges. So it's, um, it's fans votes are mixed in with expert panel judges votes as well. But so is, it vote, like, can, you, is it individual fans or, or mass fans? Is it... It's, isn't no, like, it's individual yeah. fans. So you, so we, we, for instance, all four of us can log on and vote oh, for our okay. own personal pick, um, and then that's that's um, mixed in with votes from expert panel judges yeah. who's, who's slightly weighted more. Their votes weighed uh, with more it's like strictly, it. basically, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think they decide <laughs> it in two on the Tuesday after the final game of the season. Well, well, let's turn let's turn RDZ into Anton de Beck then and get behind. <laughs> 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 Excellent stuff. Right, let's do the score predictions then. So, like we said, Sunday, uh, Brighton v Southampton. Hearty, we'll start with you. What's the score going to be? Uh, Albion 3, Southampton 0. Lovely. Frankie? Uh, I'm going to go for... I'm going to go for 2-1 Albion. 2-1 Albion. Tie 1, Darren? 2-0. Uh, 2-0, nil. Nil, I think. I think they'll bounce back from the Newcastle game and um, there'll be... Deserby was saying afterwards how you know how important the fans are going to be, and I, I really think the fans are you know going to realise the importance of this match, and it's going to be a great atmosphere at the Amex. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely, and I don't say this often, but I agree with Hearty. I think it'll be free now. So, <laughs> um, excellent. And uh, Darren, we'll start with you this time. Brighton, Man City, Wednesday. Two 0 Man City. Two 0 Man City. Not even going to yeah. get a goal. Yeah. Oh dear, Frankie. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go for 3-2 three, City. 3-2 three, three, City. Two. Thriller. Party. Well, th- this game was actually brought forward from the 23rd of April, wasn't it? It was mm. FA Cup semi-final yeah. day, yeah. Um, which, which was my actually 50th anniversary of st- uh, supporting the, the, the club. I'm the match ball sponsor on um, Wednesday night, and the club are very kindly not giving me a match ball they're giving me a signed shirt, which my grandson will have, because it's the finest ever Albion squad to date, um, you know, <laughs> to ever pull on a blue and white shirt. But I think it's going to be Brighton 1, City 1. Yeah, I'm going to go for a score draw. 2-2 two, two, I'll go for. So, um, yeah, excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Hart. It's been a pleasure having hey, you on. Good stuff. Thank you for having me on. No problem. And Darren and Frankie, enjoy the football over the weekend. And um, you can catch up with all the latest sports news and everything we talked about today at sussexworld.co.uk. And you can see Hartley's column in the Worthing Herald every week. So um, make sure you go out and buy one. But thanks, guys, and uh, speak to you soon.
Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.